Thank you, Greg. Thanks uh, for everybody, uh, for Christy and Mike and John for letting me be here today. Um, I just look at you guys for a second and breathe. It's good for me to do this. Uh, that trailer is nuts. Um, but just living in New York is the equivalent of what I just saw. <laughs> you, you spend, you know, 20 minutes trying to get from midtown to downtown and you feel like you want to blow your brains out. So, um, it's true. Uh, people always, can I be too irreverent at this? Or, yeah, so I can say fuck. Oh, all right. Well, people always uh, will ask me, I'm going to get into some slides and talk about my process and cartoons and cartooning for The New Yorker, but I deal with so much rejection uh, working for the magazine, um, and it's been great over the years. And they say, it actually, it has been great. Um, but working for The New Yorker is a lot like being sodomized. Um, <laughs> what you said, like, you know. In the beginning, it's, ow! You know, because that rejection really is, can be very painful. And, uh, and then over the years, you know, after you, you're sort of like, all right, it's all right, I can deal with this, you know. After all, it's the New Yorker, you know, you got to you know, make them happy. So uh, Ed Corrin, great uh, Vermonter and fellow New Yorker cartoonist, uh, uh, once said to me, I asked him for advice early on about cartooning, and he said, just draw. So just sit down and start drawing. And how this relates to storytelling is, is that uh, nowadays when I cartoon, I will, uh, I will just sit down and draw an image, a frame, if you will. And that I'll look at the frame. It could be anything, a uh, couple out to dinner, uh, a man walking his dog, and I'll stare at the frame and just imagine some sort of narrative that uh, preceded that frame or a narrative that uh, takes place after that frame. In essence, a story for that single image. And that story will then inform the caption for me. And I think there, there, for me that process is uh, it's, it's invaluable. It's just such a great way for me to work. And I'm going to get into that right now. So. If we can start and look at some slides. This is actually a slide I did when I was living in Nyack, New York, at this image, I should say. It's a sketch I did when I was watching the fireworks in the East Village at a friend's house. We went up and watched the fireworks. This is long before I was working for the magazine. And uh, I went back to my little basement apartment in Nyack, New York, the next day after this night, and uh, I knocked out this little black and white sketch. Years later, I was stumbling through the same sketchbook at my parents' house in Rochester, New York. And my dad was there, who's also an artist. And I looked at this sketch and I thought, wow, this is great. You know, I was working for the New Yorker at the time and I thought this might make a nice New Yorker cover. So we can go to the next slide. There's the cover right there. But, you know, this, the, you know, the story, it's also autobiographical, not autobiographical, but biographical in my father because he has social anxiety. So if you look closely, that little guy is watching the, he's watching the fireworks on TV in the window right there. <laughs> and that's, you know, I'm sure in some uh, unconscious way, you know, I was bringing my father into this, this New Yorker cover. He likes to sit in his room and watch Seinfeld all day. He, he calls it Steinfeld, though. He still, can't, he still can't figure it out. So we go to the next one. This is actually, the story behind this is quite simple. I was walking by the New York Public Library in Manhattan and uh, looked up, saw a bunch of pigeons in the back of this s sculpture that we're all probably familiar with and just thought, oh my God, it'd be hilarious if that statue came to life and just ate a pigeon. <laughs> so there are, you see the little feathers and I took some photographs, went back to Vermont, knocked out a sketch, and sent it to my cover editor. But we can go to the next one. Uh, this is a cover that is currently in a book by uh, Francoise Mouly, my editor at The New Yorker, called Blown Covers. It features many covers that uh, were rejected by The New Yorker. That, um, there's some great stuff in there. You should, you should check it out. But this cover ran 
or almost ran. It was when, uh, I guess, an uh, uh, unarmed Haitian man in, uh, I guess, in a borough of New York City was shot like 18,000 times by the New York City Police Department. That's probably, probably that, less than that a few times. But, but it's interesting the way this Trayvon Martin thing is, is very cyclical, the, the news story. But um, OK. This uh, idea came about. I really like this image, um, and I like when my cartoons and my covers become sort of social commentary, where I can actually, you know, uh, talk about the the world we live in. And this one I like because I was in the the Met, and people will often take pictures of paintings without looking at the paintings, as though they're sort of they want to capture, you know, the painting and then bring it home and upload it and say I was here, you know. I guess their story, they want, to, they want to prove that they have a story. Here's here, I was at this museum and look at it. But um, I just thought it was funny that they're not looking at the painting in there. It's not funny, it's actually sad <laughs> and depressing. So, all right, we can go to the next one. So the dog says, hey, it's me. Uh, sorry to disturb your work. I'm feeling insecure. I'm still your best friend, right? <laughs> I just like the little picture of the dog and the guy. That, uh, I have a dog, and uh, uh, again, this, 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 the story behind this is my sister, when she was first married, you know, was her first marriage, this is what she did to her, her husband. She would call, call him at work and, and say, you know, you still love me, right? You know, yeah, cheating on me, right? Yeah, everything's okay with us, right? So I did this drawing, and then the caption was, again, it's that narrative thing where the caption then came after staring at it. Okay. This guy says, yes, tech support? My laptop kept freezing up, so I stabbed it with a knife. What do I do now? <laughs> the story behind this is essentially we all can relate to. And... All right, we'll go to the next one. So on the phone, she says, let me call you back, Carol. This creepy guy I married keeps checking me out. <laughs> and I, just, I like this because I like the fact that we can be married, and uh, you know, our wives you know, will think we can be creepy, you know? You know. Okay. You must be the artist. <laughs> I like a lot of death cartoons. A lot of death cartoons. Okay. It says your grandfather just paid off his student loans. <laughs> um, this is uh, this one makes me laugh actually. I just like the grandpa back there. He's like, yes, I did it. I died right after that, you know. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. See, I like this uh, again. This is a story. It's like Artie, they took my bowl. And th again, when we talk about storytelling. This particular cartoon, I really like. Um, and uh, actually, my my wife used. I love the name Artie. She said to use the name Artie, and I thought that yes, that's a great name. But uh, I I love the, the the backstory in this one. You know, I, I, the a lot of the cartoons that I do, you know, when I do the drawing, there's definitely a narrative. What are these guys? What's their situation? You know, what, you know, he's been out. Where's he been? What's the dog been doing? What was the robbery scene like? You know, I I, I love that. Uh, I love that whole process, and when I stumble upon that, that there is a story beyond this, it's, it's, a, special, it's a special time for me. Okay. Uh, he says to his son, uh, your mother wanted you to have this for good luck, it's her foot. <laughs> so, yeah, th th this is actually based on a, <laughs> this is based on a very famous Norman Rockwell uh, painting for the Saturday Evening Post called Breaking Home Ties, where uh, the fa anybody familiar with this painting? It's a, it's a fantastic painting and a, a, really a, a, a whole movie in one frame. Um, uh, you should check it out if you can. But the father is, is a farmer and he's looking off to, the, he can hear the oncoming train. You don't see the train in the image and the son is sort of perked up like this. He's looking off to the side because he's excited he's going to college. And, Clearly, it's a working class farm family and uh, they're breaking home ties. So this was, uh, this actually, I gave this original, I met Andrew Wyeth years ago and I gave, uh, gave him this original. Uh, okay, we can go to the next one. Of course, Amish midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, as a cartoonist, you're always trying to find ways, new ways of inventing uh, these scenarios. 
Um, what what is what is a midlife crisis? Look for an Amish man. You know what is that? You know he trades in a car. Well, they don't drive cars, so you know, cheetahs. You know he's going to trade in his cheetahs for horses for a couple cheetahs. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but uh, the, there are all the sta- there we go. The staff picks are psycho misery, the Manson family, serial killers in cold blood. And the, the staff guy's looking at him like, you're dead, buddy. I am so going to kill you. Maybe not now. Maybe later. Okay, we can go to the next one. This cartoon I like, I, you know, I grew up next door to John Butler, and we love monsters. You know, we, we collected, you know, famous monsters to film land. And we, we really loved monster movies, and it, it comes through, again, story, the story of our lives. You find that a lot of times the things that you really enjoyed as a child comes full circle at some point. Um, at least it does for me. So they're destroying the city, and this guy's like, uh, you know, Lou, come here. You got to check out this guy's Degas. And I just love the fact that, because Degas is one of my favorite painters, and, you know, he's got a, a dinosaur who's, you know, familiar with the Degas. So, you got to check this out. It's a ballerina one. All right, we can go to the next one. He says, you are without a doubt the worst publicist I've ever had. You know. And this, again, I do illustrate children's books, and you have, many times I've wanted to say this to my publicist when I'm, you know, giving some, you know, talk at some bookstore in the middle of nowhere to one little girl, four-year-old girl. It's like, so you want to hear about The New Yorker? You want to know what it's like to work for them? You really want to know? I don't think so. All right. I'll let you just read this. So there's like a little narrative going on there, a little story of the, the story of the bottle of wine. Okay, go to the next one, please. The chef su- suggests you help him uh, unload last week's salmon. As uh, you know, an artist, I spent many years waitering and being in the restaurant business. Seventeen years in the restaurant business. Uh, Seventeen years. Right, Sophie. Sophie's always laughing. Uh, and that's totally true, by the way. If you know when they what they talk, you know about food. You that's. You do not want to order food on Sundays, Mondays, or Tuesdays, you know. I mean, I should say fish, yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one. He's like, it's a man purse, but I have a gun in it. <laughs> I used to carry a Samsonite suitcase for years. Now I have a Burton bag. I live in Vermont, so. But, yeah, this came about. From that. Okay, we go to the next one. She says, look at you, breaking, it, breaking out the good sweatpants today. <laughs> I love the Boston Bruins. I wear sweatpants every single day, except today. Um, so this is completely autobiographical. Okay. Uh, th- this this <laughs> th- this image is just uh, dreams are just amazing to me, and our, the, the fact that we can go to sleep. I'm still. I think I'm going to spend the next part of my life just thinking about uh, you know dreams and what they mean and. It's fascinating, really. I mean, I've, I've completed paintings in my dreams. I've actually completed a John Singer Sargent painting in my dream. That was kick-ass, you know? So uh, I, I just, there's not really a story here other than um, I just find the, the, the story in our dreams and that we've taken everything that we've experienced in our lives. And you know, when we go to bed at night, our brain is sort of taking all that stuff and it's making up a story. And it... It's crazy. It's just crazy. Okay. Is there another one? Yeah. What do you say we turn off the television, go upstairs, get into bed, and turn on our computers? (laughs) Totally autobiographical. All right. Is there another one? Let me know if the incessant complaining about my boyfriend is too much. This is from getting, getting a massage, and, you know, I hate the masseuse when they're talking about stuff, so... That's where this came from. Okay, is there another one? The dog says, what's that look? Come on, you're scaring me. You shot a bald eagle. But this is, again, this story, this, this story comes from my, my uh, older brother, Charlie, developed scoliosis when he was a young 
an adolescent, and uh, it was a pretty severe case of scoliosis. And my dad, at the time, I was there when my dad, you know, said, "Well, Ben, let's look at your spine," and it was like a really severe. And, and I remember my dad, the look on his, you know, instead of going, you know, being calm and like, "Oh, we'll go have this checked out," and he went like this. He just said, "Oh my God." And I was like, what is it, Dad? What is this guy going to do? It's just unbelievable. I'm like, dude, just so not right. All right, is there another one? I don't even know. There's, oh, well, uh, I feel bad. We only call our Coke dealer when we need something. <laughs> oh, that's clear. There's a story behind this, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I think that may be the last one, is it? That's the last one. That's the last one. Um, did I, is that enough time? We're good? Yeah. Thank you.